Well, and uh, welcome to a brand new show on markets powered by Money Control. Well, my name is Shrita Janand, and today we will be discussing about opportunities in markets, uh, IPO lineup, portfolio strategy, global diversification, etc. Well, Indian markets, just to give up, uh, you know, just of what really happened in the year FI21, well, Indian markets rallied by about 70 odd percent uh, in the last financial year. And the, and the trend suggests that the bullish momentum is likely to continue in FI22 as well. Thanks to accommodative stance by most central banks across the world, which would lead to easy monetary policy, distribution of vaccine, green shoots in the economy, and revival of earnings growth. Now, the market presented us uh, with a big wealth creating opportunity in the, in, if you remember, in the March 2020, that is last year. But thinking that a similar trend will repeat in 2021, well, that might not be right. However, every dip could be used as a buying opportunity. But the big question which every investor would have is, where to put the money well which sectors could create next set of multi-baggers well to take the discussion forward i have with me uh, deepak shunoy who's the ceo of capital mind naveen kulkarni chief investment officer at access securities alok segal head of private wealth edelweiss wealth management and devish bakil who's uh, deputy head retail research at hdfc securities well welcome to the show gentlemen Right. Well, the first question uh, I wanted to put it across to uh, you know Deepak sir that uh, you know in the recent past, at least in the last 24 to 48 hours, uh, we have seen uh, some shortage with respect to COVID vaccine. And uh, although you know our markets have been relatively stable with respect to uh, the COVID uh, uh, surge that we have seen or the second wave of COVID surge, as compared to what we saw last year uh, back in the month of March 2020 when there was a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, markets tank more than uh, you know in, in double digits uh, in March 2020, but then we saw you know a, a sort of a reversal in the year April uh, 2020. But uh, you know if in this uh, that is 2021 markets have been resilient not just for India but across the world. Uh, but yeah, you know a shortage can that be a dampener a sentiment dampener? Uh, morning, Shatish. I think I don't think um, um, you know markets are going to look at a shortage as a permanent thing. Most markets will be uh, relatively longer lo uh, outward looking and any shortages uh, in the vaccine uh, are likely to be addressed within the next two or three months. Uh, we've had about 9 crore people in India vaccinated and now likely mm -hmm. we're going to need 60 crores uh, vaccinated before we reach some kind of comfort on uh, vaccination numbers. So sure. the vaccination is probably going to continue for the rest of the year. So a shortage now will not mean a shortage in July and so on. So. But I do think that lockdowns and uh, stopping of economic activity could have some kind of impact on the market. However, the market's flush with liquidity, both from India and abroad, more than $120 billion has made its way to India uh, in different ways in the last one year. I've seen, we're seeing more in April. So I maybe the flow of liquidity might arrest the uh, uh, temporary reactions like, a lock, like lockdowns for the next one or two months. And stabilize the market uh, but you know markets are meant to be volatile so i wouldn't be surprised with uh, some kind of a fall uh, on some kind of external news right in fact uh, you rightly put it down that lockdown or a you know if if in case we see a nationwide lockdown that could be a cause of concern for markets because i think uh, you know uh, if 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 i interact with a lot of people and they say that it was a thing of past but but never say never that that has been the case for uh, indian markets and and the life in general so naveen let me put it across to you that uh, do you think covid the uh, sectoral winners of 2020 will sort of dominate uh, in the next 12 months or the coming years as well See, if we look at uh, what happened in uh, FI20, uh, sorry, FI21, and uh, the sectoral winners or the sectors which did really well, right? So the top performing sector uh, in FI21 was, of course, uh, metals and mining. That sector did very well. Thereafter, I would say that IT was another sector which did very well, and then uh, autos did well, uh, real estate did well. Right. So these are the uh, sectors which did very well. So as far as the momentum goes, I feel that the momentum for IT sector is still very, very strong. Yes, okay. the valuations have moved up, the sector uh, stock prices have gone up, but still the deal wins, everything look uh, very, very strong for the sector. And then, of course, there is an underlying uh, trend for more and more digitalization. Right. So that's a long term macro theme which is likely to sustain. 
So if you ask me whether IT will deliver the kind of returns that it delivered in FY21, maybe not, but uh, whether it will deliver a decent amount of return in uh, FY22, the answer to that is most probably yes. Right, so, so IT sector, I feel that still there is scope for uh, absolute returns. Uh, yeah. Metrics, of course, is, is a very, very different kind of a play. Uh, uh, there are global factors which influence, there is dollar index which influences the sector. However, as of now, uh, what we are seeing is that the trends are very, very strong for earnings. Right, so, so these are the two sectors which clearly stand out. Uh, uh, we can discuss, of course, more about other sectors as we proceed. Right. Uh, Devish, sir, let me come to you as well. You know, we have seen a you know roller coaster ride for market in FI21. What is your call on the markets for FI22? Should investors bear their expectation for the new financial year? Right. So as you mentioned, we had uh, about 70% kind of a growth in markets for FI21. So uh, in February, March, when the COVID hit, uh, we had a sharp correction and Nifty went down to as low as 70 500 levels and then yeah. from there we had a humongous run so that kind of run is obviously not expected in fi22 uh, coming to the numbers i think oh, most of the analysts right now uh, the consensus earnings for fi21 for nifty companies is around 530 rupees per share and for fi22 uh, consensus earning is about 35 percent growth so that will bring the Nifty earnings to up to 720 rupees per share. And mm -hmm. on top of that, we are expecting uh, about 20% growth in FI23. Mm -hmm. So that will bring the aggregate earnings to about 860 rupees per share. So if you would discount those 860 rupees uh, with the current prices, which is we are around 14,800 levels or so in Nifty, so we are already discounting. FI23 earnings by about 19 times uh, forward earnings. So right. we are fairly valued that way, 19 times, mm -hmm. uh, two years down the line. So it's a fairly rich valuation. But uh, as uh, uh, others have pointed out, and you also mentioned in the beginning of the show, that yeah. uh, given the monetary policy, uh, the loose monetary policy, and trillions of dollars of uh, amount of money is trading at a zero yield or negative yield, uh, I read somewhere in the morning that uh, about $100 trillion are right now invested in your bonds, which are yielding less than 1% uh, kind of yield. So with that kind of money slossing around the system, I think uh, these higher valuations are likely to sustain and uh, we will uh, uh, trade near this level. So earnings growth, uh, strong earning growth is more or less discounted. And in FI22, we will have about uh, 10 to 12% kind of a growth in uh, prices i'm not expecting a huge uh, growth from here right i'm sure uh, earnings so do not disappoint disappoint us because that is the that is one factor which is uh, which uh, you know the market is banking on at this point in time and uh, you know no further lockdowns would mean that earnings would would uh, uh, go in the similar direction at least in a linear phase but we'll come to uh, the earnings, uh, you know, uh, with uh, back to you, Devesh, in some time. But uh, let me understand from a, uh, you know, from a psychological perspective, uh, Alok. Uh, uh, you know, apart from the other things, the COVID has, uh, you know, changed the way we invest. Uh, in fact, there was a report I read that which highlighted that 70% of Indian consumers have increased saving and investment post-pandemic, which is definitely a good thing. So, what is the trend that you're picking up from your side, and tips you would like to give it to investors for wealth generation for uh, FI22? Sure. Well, thank you, Shitesh. So there are a few things that we have seen that, you know, have uh, evolved over the last uh, one year. So one is a clear DIY trend. You know, if you see the volume that have uh, come up, you know, in direct equities and, you know, uh, March was the first month where actually mutual fund uh, net flows are positive And, you know, uh, but oh, other than that, <laughs> yeah. if you see otherwise, there's been a massive inflow that's come into direct equities. And this is a proliferation of, you know, DIY apps. And, you know, obviously, Zerodha, likes of Zerodha have done very, very well. Sure. So one is that, you know, investors have, uh, you know, liked to access the markets directly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of digitization as we speak. And some of the other uh, gentlemen have, before me have spoken. But one of the trends that we have seen uh, both on, you know, our Ultra HNI and uh, the HNI site is that the acceptance of digital platforms has gone up tremendously. So one is obviously on the investment side, but also in the way they do business. You know, mm -hmm. uh, earlier you, you could actually, it was very difficult to do business if you're not sitting in front of a client. 
today people are comfortable doing you know microsoft teams zooms account openings are happening digital kyc has happened so a lot of innovation has happened in the covid period uh, to answer your question sorry i i digressed a little bit but to answer your question yes there is a proliferation of you know savings and investments because people have also realized the value of savings in these tough times you know people have seen around them you know job losses happening industries uh, taking cuts etc and specifically last year in april may most industries announced to pay cut right. so from that point of view you know we saw a lot of uh, people coming back into you know savings and investments however uh, we have been strongly advising our clients to stick to asset allocation because you know market mm -hmm. has seen uh, you know a wavered uh, right it is it was up one way after uh, april and again obviously it pulled down a bit now but we have been you know advising and advocating our clients to stick to their long term goals and asset allocation and that is you know, our advice and probably touch up more on that uh, during the course of the show no no abs absolutely and in fact uh, you know this is one thing uh, the way the way we are looking at things or the way investors are looking at things has has seen a sea change from let's say you know five years before and what we are seeing right now in fact ipos have come up and for that uh, uh, you know uh, deepak sir let me let me come to you uh, we've seen a sharp rise in the markets and you know boyd boyd with that sentiment we've seen plenty of action in the primary market space as well uh, with so much of option you know it becomes difficult for investors to pick the right stock and we've seen uh, you know your commentary on ipos and, and you've been spot on on a lot of these things so what should be the checklist of investors while investing in the upcoming ipo and uh, you know what can what one should keep in mind uh, while investing because see at the end of the day consumers or the investors would have so much of money to invest you know they might not have uh, uh, you know uh, billions of dollars or let's say billions of rupees to invest uh, in every ipo they can only invest probably in one out of 10 ipos so i i think that's a conscious choice which one everyone has to make yes there are a lot of uh, ipos a lot of thematic ipos have come up uh, in the recent past, which, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of us are lure to invest in that. So, what are you? So, uh, Chitish, I think you know the problem. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, we we've, we've heard this line on on CNBC also before. Is um, you know, if you want an IPO, uh, you don't get allocation, and if you get allocation, you probably don't want the IPO. So, um, <laughs> the sure. probability one of the, the the rush to IPOs is so crazy, and it's mostly leveraged. Uh, HNIs that are putting in quite considerable amounts of money. Uh, this account, uh, uh, you know, block uh, ASBA, which is uh, application supported by blocked amounts, mm -hmm. means the money doesn't even actually leave your account until you get allocations. This sure. has allowed people to apply for more than perhaps they would have otherwise applied for. Um, uh, so, you know, what I would say is if you're a retail investor, uh, you should study the prospectus. And if you, you know, if you can go through and understand the business, that is a, a kind of a behavior that is expected. But at the IPO, you have very little information. What has happened in the past does not have a lot of disclosures. You might want to take positions based on a uh, time-based approach, saying I'll, maybe I'll put an initial allocation and then I'll add more as time goes by, as the company shows uh, uh, good results. You can always add more at a later point. If you're a retail investor, in all probability, you'll get like one lot, which is 15,000 rupees, which is not going to change a lot of lives. Uh, yes. And for the HMIs, what happens is they get a lot of calls from uh, the financial institutions to borrow. And typically, NBFCs, because banks can't do this business, uh, they get, you know, you put 10 lakhs, I'll give you one and a half crores as a loan, we'll apply, we'll get a small allocation for those four days when you pay as interest. This is fraught with a lot of uh, danger. We've seen this uh, work very badly in the Reliance Power IPO in 2008. That caused the, that was the beginning of the bear market of 2008 as well. So I would say uh, avoid going this leverage route for IPOs. And in general, um, uh, look at the prospects of a company over a longer term. You're not, you don't have to buy today. There's no, you're not, I mean, uh, you know, there's no hurry to say, this is the exact time. If I don't invest today, it's all over. So uh, I have invested in businesses in the downturn last year. I have invested in them after they were up 100% from them. And they're still up another 100% from this. It's like it doesn't, you don't have to feel that it's a lost cause if you didn't get in at the bottom. So, uh, investing at the IPO is not the only thing, uh, only way you can participate in the company's growth. You can wait a quarter or two, wait for results, and then see if they're actually doing what they're saying they're doing, and then invest. So, absolutely. And good thing that you, uh, you know, mentioned about leverage. 
and uh, you know a recent case which has come up uh, in uh, you know in the past week 10 days is the archigos fire sale now let me said let me come to you on that uh, you know it it does remind us that we still live in a world that is vulnerable to external shocks uh, but it is just one off case and over leverage and greed are top you know you could say top broad factors that keep us uh, resulting in black swan events uh, what are your views and and you know there's another thing which i want to probably add here is that uh, uh, when we're talking about leverage we also talk about uh, you know the harshad mehta scam that came up you know leverage and greed two most important things to be very honest this is not the first case that we have seen right uh, globally uh, of uh, the over leverage uh, uh, factors impacting the markets see if you look at uh, the global investment banks business uh, which is uh, the, the banks which are or the, uh, the the large brokers who are involved in uh, funding these kind of uh, hedge funds right so one of the critical aspects is that uh, for most of them the easy money is not there right so they, you have to provide these kind of products to make money uh, right so where leverage is a very very critical component where um, the brokers make money on interest component and uh, typically um, uh, you will have uh, rash hedge funds uh, who do over leverage uh, and they are the ones who are willing to pay the most of the interest fees right so uh, so 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 what i'm trying to say here is that it's it's not something which is uh, which is going to go away with today right because we saw that what happened with uh, with archigos right so this is this is a systemic problem and it it is going to keep recurring at uh, several points in time and um, my sense here is that of course india as a country of course the norms in india are a uh, little more stringent so we may not have the kind of leverage cases that we have uh, in the global uh, uh, market but uh, i would say that the, this global phenomena is going to uh, continue so we had uh, long term capital management going bust in the 90s right where actually it was bailed out by federal reserve in terms of how uh, the fund was unwound right so, so these are the challenges which which have been there in the system for the last 25 30 years and it's uh, not going to go away so quickly as long as uh, cheap money exists which uh, in, in the near foreseeable future it will exist uh, 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 transaction costs are very very low so the ways to make money is through uh, these kind of business for uh, the large investment banks or for brokers so this uh, phenomena is going to continue and that's that's a, that's something which is uh, quite scary over the long term right i think uh, the the big but the big problem is here is that uh, nobody understands when to stop and you know for that uh, uh, deepak i i read in one of your blogs that uh, no matter how many books have been written on ltcm bear stearns the 2008 great financial crisis and what not the world banks will simply not learn so you know I, this is something which uh, probably an every investor should should put in place you know we keep on we keep on uh, advising investors that put risk management in place though why these big institutions do not have these factors to be fair it's because we rescue them every time we uh, <laughs> uh, you know we we don't care if uh, you're playing with the houses money and if anything goes wrong the the world system will come and save you and uh, uh, it's not even that you know people go to jail or they face consequences for their actions so nobody has for aig nobody has uh, for a lot of uh, firms so uh, even with uh, you know archigo archigos or however it is pronounced i think the problem uh, stems from a simple uh, uh, concept that they didn't want to reveal that they were owning so much of of uh, these companies they were actually own 68% of one company and that's not allowed and uh, you know they don't they didn't directly own it they made the banks own it by creating a swap which the bank hedged by taking a, a counter position and uh, you can see this everywhere ltcm was extremely hedged carvi in india was extremely uh, leveraged uh, ilfs was leveraged uh, dhfl um was cause i mean the story will we will write about it sometime we are actually doing a podcast on this as well the the problem really is this um, at an individual level if you are leveraged you go down it's your problem uh, systemic leverage is uh, where the problem is and even in india we have elements of systemic leverage that are extreme and uh, i hope none of that comes to you know uh, hurt us but uh, mm -hmm. over time the regulators in india have acted much better than the western regulators the problem is the west is so big in comparison mm -hmm. with india the size is so much bigger 
that right. uh, they don't care about their own institutions taking so much leverage, uh, sometimes 30 times, 35 times. To give you an example, if I if I am 35 times leveraged, a 3% fall in a portfolio, a 3% loss wipes me out completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are European institutions and American institutions that have this kind of leverage. They're worth billions and billions of dollars. So uh, mm -hmm. we do remain at risk that this will happen. I can, right. you know, uh, hundreds of people can write about this, but I don't think we will learn because um, the system is more important than, you know, finding out who did something wrong. System is more important. Well, uh, getting away from the you know little bit of bad news or the negative news about leverage, let's also understand, focus on good things in life. I think uh, let's come to Devesh sir. Uh, what are the uh, you know opportunities you foresee in the year FI twenty two and beyond uh, with respect to sectors? Right. So uh, we had a pandemic and that uh, affected the last quarter, the March quarter last financial year, but we will not have uh, that kind of uh, problem this uh, March quarter. So most of the uh, the sectors are likely to do well this uh, Brazil season. Yeah. At the aggregate level, we, we feel that the Nifty earnings can go up by about 65% uh, when the results are announced for the March quarter. And some sectors are uh, going to stand out. Uh, mm -hmm. At the aggregate level, I think metals are the one which are going to do a uh, lot of uh, uh, heavy lifting for the earnings. Okay. Uh, okay. At the aggregate level, we feel that the uh, earnings are going to go up by four times. So about 300% jump is expected at the metals. Uh, then private and public sector banks, uh, there about 100% uh, YOI growth is expected. True. Other sectors like uh, capital goods, uh, consumer durables, there about 60-70% 60, YOI growth is expected. So uh, mind you, these companies' uh, uh, profits are going to go up this much and market has already uh, started discounting them. Some earlier, some in last few weeks, uh, as we see that the metal stocks have also started running up. So oh, markets true. have started discounting. Uh, discounting these earnings. The sectors which are likely to underperform are, I think, media, uh, telecom, uh, and infrastructure sectors. I think okay. there the uh, earnings are likely to underperform. FMCG, there there, there was not a disruption, so I think there uh, the uh, earnings are going to be flat. All right. Right. Uh, Alok, sir, let me come to you, um, you know, as well that, uh, you know, Right, you know, we've we've created the portfolio. Uh, we've got all the sectors in place. That means which are the sectors that are likely to outperform. But there's one big theme which came in, uh, in FI21, and I'm sure it's going to dominate in FI22 as well, and that is global diversification, right? The multi-million dollar infra package announced by the U.S. government will indeed benefit plenty of stocks in the U.S. as well as back in India. So what are your views? What are the trends that you are, uh, you know, witnessing uh, with respect to global diversification? You know, people are more uh, open about uh, uh, putting some money, uh, you know, in U.S. markets or in global markets. Very much. In fact, uh, we have seen uh, in the last financial year, you know, and even now we are seeing, uh, you know, a lot of the fund houses, uh, in fact, launched products around, uh, you know, accessing global portfolios. So we had, you know, access to U.S. technology stocks. We had access to, you know, S&P 500, the Nasdaq, or just the broader uh, U.S. markets. And uh, not only that, but also we've seen people going for China uh, also. So we have seen, uh, you know, specifically, you know, a lot of interest from our h &I customers in accessing global markets and specifically if you see the US technology stocks because that's a sector which has done uh, really really well in the last one year and obviously there have been right. a few you know uh, outshined uh, stars like you know Tesla which have become you know uh, people are more fans than you know I think investors there uh, right. but you are you are increasingly seeing people wanting to uh, have a pie of that uh, so again there you know the approach that we take is obviously mm -hmm. not going a single stock it is very difficult for an individual investor sitting in india mm -hmm. to access or you know have a view on an individual stock in the us it's always better to have a portfolio approach so access it through funds uh, but we are definitely encouraging our clients to access both us and china mm -hmm. and there is a, a clear uh, room for diversification uh, available there and uh, because you know india uh, currently for the indian investor 100 percent of his exposure is in a single currency and uh, this is the only opportunity for him to also do, apart from gold, to some extent, which any all Indian households have uh, in plenty. But apart right. from gold, this is possibly the only place where you know people can actually diversify both the currency and the country. 
and uh, but obviously uh, the valuations in US etc also have uh, gone up markets are at all time high but uh, long term we feel that you know the way uh, the new as you rightly said the new infrastructure package has come uh, it will lead to structural uh, you know growth in the economy and therefore uh, we we feel that investors should look at you know the us markets from a 2 to 3 year horizon also not for a short term right now not for a short term right uh, now uh, deepak sir i'll also come to you and uh, understand uh, where are you seeing the opportunities uh, you know in terms of sectors uh, for fy22 no i i'm not sure about fy22 because there's so much in flux but for the uh, long term yeah. yeah longer term so here's the thing there's some themes that are obvious to us right now right so you're getting digital digitalization of the economy there's sure. the movement to a more digital financial system so Uh, obviously players in that space are going to increase and uh, benefit over the longer term we just don't know who the winners are same with electric vehicles uh, we believe that the, the the scale is enormous it's not restricted to perhaps just cars and uh, 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 some you know levels of commercial vehicles it's a much bigger opportunity over here uh, but again we don't know who the winners are so we'll have to take place our bets carefully Uh, we also feel that uh, localization is a theme, and I'm seeing localization as the uh, <clears throat> a little bit of the opposite of globalization, where uh, you know everybody is happy to source from a China or a Taiwan, but now people are talking about oh no, we need our own stuff. Apple's building its own chips. Google's talking about building its own chips. Amazon will as well for uh, their things. Why, why do we need that when you had global super uh, uh, computing uh, engines like Intel, AMD, Nvidia, and so on? It, one of the uh, reasoning is, is that uh, you know changing the supply deoptimizing supply chains is also going to be uh, an interesting uh, is going is going to create more opportunity even though you may not be optimal at the uh, cost level there but the overall business can actually generate more margins in the longer term because you have more control uh, over a lot of uh, aspects here we're seeing this across a lot of areas not just chips but we're also seeing it in Uh, supply chain in, in e-commerce uh, people own the whole vertical stack when yeah. uh, you don't you typically don't need to people are going direct to customer uh, uh, firms like ours and even mutual funds are more accessing customers directly rather than going through distributors so a lot of these changes are, are going to be dynamic dramatic in the next 10 years we should bet on the winners but you won't know who the winners are so you're going to have to take a portfolio approach find a lot of companies in this space this is why you know the zomatos the swiggies the, the new startups are going to be so exciting because they have a clean slate to work with they don't have the baggage of the past uh we're going to bet on disruption in the next uh, 10 years and uh, you know already you're seeing uh, an info edge and a number of listed players uh, investing in these startups because building it in house is perhaps not possible you can't generate the same kind of uh, uh, enthusiasm or morale uh, and i think a lot of these startups will list as well in the next few years so uh, very exciting times but i won't uh, pick companies or sectors today i'll just say themes are interesting companies and sectors may change right well i on disruptors that is the you know key word uh, which uh, deepak sir is recommending to investors uh, uh, navin sir let me come to you as well and uh, wanted to understand with you how the market is likely to pan out from your uh you know the way you've seen markets uh, not just you know in fi21 but you know uh, in 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 your decades of experience uh, uh you know you've seen the cycles and uh, probably you know we have seen in the last one year there's only one cycle that we've seen that is the up cycle <laughs> you know market only went in one direction so what are your what is your call on markets uh, for the coming 12 months or for the coming in the near term yes sir uh, so the theme which um, as uh, Uh, many of us are talking about right so there are these broad teams which are doing quite well but more importantly what we are actually uh, thinking and what we are actually looking at is let's say that the earnings growth were to actually uh, come at around 30% for fy22 right okay. so we are looking at let's say around um, 700 rupees kind of an eps for uh, uh, the nifty as an index and then 20% for fy23 right so what does this mean from an from a market perspective right there are a lot of factors which have to actually work for this to happen what is the economy should revive uh, to the extent that we are actually talking about so if these things actually play out what it will mean is that uh, that 
we are going to see a very, very broad economic revival. I sense that if that were to uh, play out, we I definitely believe that the cyclicals will still do better in FI22 and FI23 uh, also. That's something which is very, very likely to play out. By cyclicals, of course, I could, uh, we could look at various sets of uh, sectors. Uh, Cement has been doing quite well. It might continue to do well. Metals are doing quite well. They might continue to do well. More so, what we would also be looking at if the earnings revival as such is so strong for a uh, large index like Nifty, then probably the mid cap and the small cap indices might also do very, very well because the earnings revival for them might be even stronger. Because if the broader economy revives, they can, they have more opportunities. They have a low base. They can grow faster. Right. So that's the that's what we are looking at. Uh, we are very, very carefully observing what to pick, what not to pick in mid caps and small caps, right? Because that's where I think a lot of wealth could be created. And if I can play with uh, combine it with some of the themes, then of course, then it's like. Uh, uh, a uh, great, great way to look at it. So uh, essentially, this is what we are looking at. Uh, we should see a 50 to 20 percent return in FY22, very, very likely. That's point number one. Point number two, what we are looking at from a thematic perspective will be mid cap, small caps and large cap value will be the three broad themes that we would be looking at investing. Right. Interesting uh, observations there, uh, Naveen. And, uh, you know, lastly, uh, let me come to Alok here. And uh, how do you explain to your clients that, you know, builds a portfolio is not a T20 match, but a test match. And the only thing which will create wealth for you is patience. Not easy. Let me start with that. <laughs> not easy. It's not the, easy, right. To, you know, more sophisticated to, you know, uh, I don't want to quantify too much here. It will be bad for my business, but uh, <laughs> it is not easy. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have been, uh, what we've been advising our clients is that, you know, for at least, and for specifically the, you know, the medium to large size clients is yeah. that for, you know, at least to 70 to 80% of your portfolio, please stick to the basics. Please stick to the core. You have created a certain framework basis, which you want to invest for the long term. And mm -hmm. obviously follow that asset allocation through. And uh, we keep on, you know, uh, you know, rebuilding that thesis. And you know, every time the market falls, we obviously help them revalidate that thesis through either top-ups or you know, uh, back-tested studies. But our approach has been that for 80% of your portfolio, please don't do anything. You know, let it let it lie, and obviously monitor it very actively. And for you know, 20%, for 20%, you know, you can actually have you know a lot of this daily excitement, whatever you want to do. You know, you want to play with something. You know, because obviously people have that. You know, they want to. They, they're the bias for action is very high. You know, mm -hmm. in India, and I think in the world that we are in the investment world, the bias for action is very high. So we say that you know, you please do that with you know 20%, and for the 80%, so that there is a you know, uh, it is invested with a certain objective. And obviously, we are also looking at, you know, a lot of, uh, as you know, Deepak said, that, you know, a lot of the disruptors and a lot of the new themes. So that can be part of, you know, your 20% uh, of your portfolio because that gives you the excitement also. And it obviously can be going forward, it can be something, uh, some of these bets mm -hmm. can be huge. But as you rightly said, you know, investment is not a T20 match. It is a long term uh, test match, possibly longer than a test. Mm -hmm. And it why is serious nerves? Because, you know, when people see drawdowns in their portfolio, it's not easy. Yeah. It's not at all easy when you see drawdowns in your portfolio. You know, the bravest are shaken uh, when they see, you know, drawdowns like we saw last year in March. Uh, and people start questioning, you know, uh, the fundamentals of absolutely the most blue chips that you can ever have. So True. the key has been that, you know, to obviously be with your clients in these periods. Keep on, uh, you know restating the basics, restating the facts that, you know, this is your long-term portfolio and stick to that. You know, uh, we, we're trying to make investments as a very, you know, simple and a basic theme for our clients. We don't want to overcomplicate. The problem is that most people overcomplicate investments and make, you know, and the, in that, you know, people make a lot of mistakes and people go for, you know, high per trends. So we are fundamental principles are very clear that, you know, this is a very hard earned money that you spend, you know, uh, in fact, for most cases, your entire working life to, you know, get this money. So let's uh, help you, you know, do it in a proper manner uh, with a long term uh, view. So that's uh, what we think. Wonderful conversation, gentlemen. And yes, hard earned money spent wisely. That is the key message uh, here. And uh, well, on that note, well, thank you, everyone, for your time. And it was a pleasure interacting with each and everyone. And I'm sure our viewers would take note of the views on various sectors, asset allocation, 
as well as in how one should pick stocks uh, uh, you know in the coming years and just to add the views and uh, investment tips uh, expressed by experts on the show are their own and not that of the website or the management. Money Control advises users to check with certified experts before taking any investment decisions. Thanks a lot for your time, but do stay log on to moneycontrol.com for more on news, business, and economy. Again, thank you so much for your time. That's a wrap from our side. Mm -hmm.